I'm recording this. I just started recording it. It is playing over in um, Facebook, as I said before, but I had, I had paused the recording here. Oh, and there's another. Sorry for the uh, delays, but uh, we should get going here. So that's who we are. And a lot of our questions, um, well, in fact, all of our questions came from Windsor County Democrats and actually had many more questions that than I could possibly ask tonight. Uh, so I've spent quite some days uh, kind of distilling them down to a reasonable number of questions uh, that we can um, uh, actually have a chance of getting through. And we're probably not gonna get through them all. So uh, to be realistic, uh, it's just, it's, it's just unlikely. But um, now I'm going to ask that you all mute yourselves except our three candidates, if you don't mind. We're not going to do questions from the, um, uh, you know, from the, from the floor. It's too complicated. Uh, I should be seeing, uh, Shar, you should be why am I seeing you up there? Oh, uh, let's see. And Alice, I'm seeing you there too. Okay. Well, let's see how this goes. Um, the, the way we established um, tonight's session is that you're each going to have uh, five minutes to tell us in the broadest, well, as broad or as specifically as you can, uh, why you are running for governor what you bring to this position. This is your elevator. Pretend it's a long elevator ride. And if you don't need all five minutes, that's fine. But your opening statement to uh, the folks that are here and on our Facebook page, and I'm gonna ask, uh, initially, I'm gonna ask uh, uh, Mr. Winburn as our guest from uh, down in Bennington, uh, please uh, introduce yourselves to our folks and, and why they should be interested and supportive of you in your run for governorship. Well, I'm uh, Pat Winburn, and uh, I am uh, from Bennington. And uh, I'd like to thank Al and uh, the Windsor Democrats uh, for inviting me uh, here tonight. Um, I've talked to a number of you, but I, I'm sure I haven't talked to everybody. And, uh, you know, I am a, a Democrat. I'm a Democrat, I'm, uh, probably the only Democrat on the panel who actually went to the Jimmy Carter inauguration and uh, the Bill Clinton inauguration. And uh, I wish that I had gone to be able to go to the Obama administration or uh, inauguration, but that wasn't uh, possible. Uh, but, you know, I'm a, I'm a Democrat, I'm a father, and I'm a trial lawyer. And I've spent uh, nearly four decades in the courtrooms fighting insurance companies. And I have uh, also done a lot of other uh, types of things. Uh, I've been a, uh, the, the chairman, or, or I've been on the, the, uh, the, um, uh, the school board uh, in uh, Manchester. I've been uh, on the Bennington Rutland Supervisory Union. I've also been the president of the Humane Society in Bennington County and the past president of uh, the United Way in Bennington County. And currently I serve as, a, uh, uh, as the moderator of the village of Old Bennington. And I've, I've tried a lot of cases, as I said, uh, throughout the uh, state. I've tried cases in uh, Windsor County, and, uh, which is near and dear to my heart. And uh, it's a beautiful area. And uh, you're, everybody in Windsor County is very lucky uh, to live in such a beautiful uh, place. Uh, but we in uh, Bennington County, we're a little farther south. And uh, we, you know, uh, are not uh, really given a fair shake uh, by uh, Montpelier. And uh, we're certainly not Chittenden County. And uh, we uh, do our best uh, here. And uh, we also... Um, like to, uh, you know, I'd also like to uh, mention that, uh, you know, Governor Phil Scott is not campaigning, and uh, I don't take any vote uh, for granted. Um, you know, I've uh, pledged to 
uh, accept $15 as my public salary in the event that uh, I'm elected, which I believe I will be. And uh, Governor Scott hasn't responded to that. Uh, Governor Scott uh, apparently thinks he's the king of Vermont. He's not going to debate, not going to campaign. He's going to sit back and uh, wait for, uh, you know, rest on his laurels and use sort of a Vermont, uh, uh, Montpelier Rose, uh, Rose Garden strategy. But, you know, I think it's, it's got to be different. And uh, that's one of the reasons that I'm running. And I hope to, to meet everybody in person uh, on the campaign trail. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Um, uh, second, if we could have uh, uh, Rebecca, if you could uh, give us your opening remarks and introduce yourselves to uh, everyone that's here. Uh, though actually, uh, oh, I see Rebecca. Oh, uh, maybe it's uh, Rebecca. Are you still? Are you still here? There you are. Oh, you. I have to unmute you. There you go. <laughs> Okay, that now you should be able to unmute. No? Yep. No. Uh, you have to do something as well, though, I think, after I, after I do that. Huh. Well, that's what we were doing last week. Um, Go to somebody else. Yep, I guess we will go to, uh, and we'll get back to you, Rebecca, uh, uh, try to figure that one out. Uh, but Lieutenant Governor uh, David Zuckerman, if you could uh, be up next, that would be most appreciated. Sure. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, having the event. Al, thank you for doing all the work to prepare this. And, uh, you know, I want to start by honoring George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and so many others uh, that have been taken uh, by brutality, frankly, uh, whether it's uh, police brutality or vigilante brutality and injustice. And uh, I think we're all feeling that right now. Um, and I just want to give a moment to acknowledge that. You know, many of you are familiar with me. I really appreciate all of you being here right now. Uh, you know that uh, I've been in office now for over 20 years in the House and in the Senate. Uh, my name, by the way, is David Zuckerman. Uh, many of you know that also I'm a farmer, uh, background there behind me, small business owner, father, uh, and of course, running to be your next governor. And over those 20 years of service, I have met obviously many of you, uh, but many others around the state, organizing in living rooms and coffee shops and talking to people in rotaries and listening to the issues that people are facing and the challenges that they have. And, and that is what's motivating me to serve and to run for this office. Uh, as we know, Vermonters are struggling more now than ever. Uh, under the COVID-19 crisis, we're seeing working class Vermonters uh, really exposed for the economic struggles that have been going on and that some of us have been talking about for a long time, but far more people are aware of it, how many people have been living on the edge. Uh, older Vermonters uh, deserve to be able to stay in their homes complete and live in their homes for their ending of their lives as well, not be potentially in these settings that are far more dangerous. Uh, students uh, and English language learners are really struggling, uh, those with disabilities under our lack of broadband and challenges in learning remotely. And parents obviously are struggling uh, quite a bit to not only work if they can keep their job, but also be helping their kids learn uh, while juggling as childcare is closed and schools are closed. And we're going to really have to deal with a lot of the trauma uh, that's come from this whole circumstance, some with actually increased rates of abuse under the stress in many homes. And so it's really important that someone be in that office as governor who's thinking about all these things and going to be working proactively to make sure we don't have deeper challenges in the future from these. You know, our administration has reacted. I think he deserves credit for reacting well to this situation. We've all worked well and hard to flatten the curve. And I want to thank all Vermonters for doing your part. You know, many, or at least most, hopefully, are wearing masks. Folks are washing their hands. They're keeping distant. But I have to say, it's not um, a, a situation that, uh, that has been handled well with respect to proactive thinking. We have a reactive governor, but this governor vetoed minimum wage, vetoed paid family leave, has done little about the climate crisis. And these are policies that 
would actually have set Vermonters up better to handle this situation. Fewer people would have been in dire straits getting, having difficulty getting through the unemployment system with paid family leave and a higher minimum wage if you not vetoed it. And we need to put Vermonters to work. We could put Vermonters to work right now, putting in hands-free sinks and toilets in the schools, laying cable across the state, not only for education purposes, but to expand our rural economy. And of course, we have to accelerate building more affordable housing, particularly in village centers, as we're now seeing out-of-staters looking to buy land here, and that's gonna really challenge Vermonters to be able to live and stay here. When I announced I was running for governor, it was because of the urgency of our challenges, the opportunity that I've had to serve and the opportunity I have to serve as your governor and to lead and to do great things with the people of Vermont. Vermonters are doing amazing work right now with mutual aid groups and other ways to collaborate and we have amazing ingenuity in Vermont. But of course, the pandemic has exposed these inequalities. Over 50,000 Vermonters don't have access to broadband. Those who have small savings or none at all, we're seeing the real struggles that this past economy created, even when it was good. Uh, and we really are seeing that essential employees have been underpaid for decades. It's time for us to rebuild and build a new economy for Vermont coming out of this where everybody is respected and everybody is valued. And as your governor, I'm gonna bring the issues and those Im impacted the most, teachers, medical professionals, first responders, essential workers, small business owners and Vermonters of all races, ages and abilities together to bring creative and forward thinking ideas. Many of you have seen my work in the past where we have led on policies like marriage equality, raise the minimum wage. These are the things we need to do to build for the future. We need to get more money into working Vermonters pockets so that when adverse conditions arise, they're better prepared and not as on the edge of disaster. We need to build an economy that puts people back to work with jobs that pay livable wages, not sublivable wages. We need to support our youth and tackle the climate crisis with a rural economy that builds, not takes away from what's happening in Vermont right now. And how is it possible that we're the only developed country in the world that is people are losing healthcare access while undergoing the COVID crisis? As people lose their jobs, they're losing their healthcare. This is absurd. And we have to help folks, as I said earlier, safely age in their homes and communities. And we clearly need more affordable housing. So as governor, I'm gonna fight for investments for our future. That means not cutting in an austerity budget the way that's being proposed by the current governor, but investing in prenatal care, early child care and education, support for our public schools, not cutting them as our governor has proposed, support for our state colleges and adding to our technical training programs. These state colleges and training schools are actually the heart of a lot of the economy in our rural areas. And that is something we cannot let get lost in this discussion. All right. Thank, thank you, Lieutenant Governor. It's uh, the five minutes go, but a, a number of the things you brought yeah. up, we're going to get to. Sure. So um, no problem. I think we're good on uh, uh, Rebecca. You're you I are think good. No, so. can you hear me? Yes, we can. <laughs> That's so. great. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry thank you. about that. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. This happened at one of the other debates as well. Um, first of all, thank you all uh, for coming tonight, and thank you, Al, for organizing this. And I want to give a special thanks to some of the legislators who are here today. I know how hard you're working right now, uh, despite some of the odds and some of the lack of guidance from the governor, to do the right thing for Vermont, to make sure Vermonters are protected and cared for in the middle of this health crisis and as you plan for the economic recovery to come. So thank you for your work. Uh, many of you know me. I am Rebecca Holcomb. I served as your Secretary of Education for four years. And as a teacher, a district leader, and as your Secretary of Education, I worked hard every day to make sure every Vermonter had a fair chance to succeed. And that's why I'm running for governor. I'm running for governor because we have work to do to make this great state a place where every Vermonter can live well in a healthy environment feel confident that when they turn on their tap or go swimming, the water is clean, and know that they'll be able to be safe, feed their family, and live in our Vermont communities. But first, I do want to acknowledge what I know weighs heavily on the minds of many of you, and that's the burning evidence that you've spoken to me about and that we can't ignore, that, that some people in Vermont and around the nation count more than others, and it's feeling even more urgent as our president talks about bringing the military into DC. 
we are literally and figuratively choking off the hope of far too many Americans, those we see from Breonna Taylor to George Floyd, but also the many who suffer outside the public eye. We were faced with three crises, economic, health, and environmental, but now underlying racial injustice has brought to, to the surface a fourth, and we can't go back to normal. If it wasn't clear before, we all know that we have to work together to build a better future, and that's what this campaign is about. Now is the time more than ever to listen and learn from Vermont's black and brown citizens, to put their voices at the center of the conversations that we need to have about how to build better than we were before. For. Most Vermonters want to be fair, but we also can see in policing, in education, in healthcare, and in environmental impact, our marginalized communities face barriers and bias that push aside that are making it even harder for them to succeed. And we can't tolerate that because when we don't give everybody a fair chance, then we are all worse off and we all suffer. I spoke with a young black Vermonter today, a 14 year old and her mother, and I wanted to share what she said with you as we start today. She said every day is a struggle for her in school and what she really wants is the freedom to just be a child, the freedom to just be what she loves to do and not just be the black child. She wants to be free to feel safe and free to not have to explain herself all the time. She wants white voices to speak out for her, she said, because she's learned that white people don't listen to her. That hurts to hear. And her mom wants to trust that when she goes to school and into the world, her daughter doesn't have to worry about which white people here in Vermont are friends and which are foe. And we can do better than this. They worry also because they know that on top of race, many others like them fight also against the burdens of class, disability, language, and gender. And she asked me tonight to use my privilege to call on all of us to work together to make sure that we ensure the basic freedoms we take for granted for all Vermonters. Because she said, aren't they Vermonters too? These dark days are a test of who we are as a nation and whether we believe in and are willing to commit to being a more perfect union. Do we care about the welfare of children in a racist state? Do we care that a family that works really hard can afford to keep a roof over their head and food on the table? Do we care about keeping our environment clean so the next generation can have health and safety? What are we willing to do to make these dreams and these rights real? A health crisis, an economic crisis, a climate emergency, and now racial injustice. Many of you have told me you're angry and exhausted about what's going on. So I'm thanking you today for showing up, being here to vote in this primary, and being here to vote in November. Because we can't eat talk, and our Vermonters want more. They know that inequality leads to poor outcomes in schools and in healthcare and in so many things that matter. And in order to fix this broken system, we need people who can change it people who will walk the walk. We need new voices at the table to shift and add urgency to conversations and change the way we've been operating for over 20 years. People who will push for change even when it makes some people uncomfortable. We need leaders who can lead this state and will hold us accountable for action at the social level as well so that we can take out any barrier that keeps some of our Vermonters and our neighbors from success. That's why I'm running for governor, to be that governor, to have the back of Vermonters who are trying really hard to make this more perfect union that we know we deserve. Thank you. And you sound much better unmuted, I have to tell you. Thank I you. hope so. And, uh, yeah, no, very much. And I apologize for the, for the technology. Um, well, on that topic, actually, I'd like, well, there's been, it was a number of things from all three of you, but you know, I was originally going to start with questions on, uh, and there's so many places that you could start, but I think we're all consumed with the news of the day. So I'd like to start with that, and, and Rebecca, let's dig into it a little deeper, as long as you're there. Um, uh, all of this dramatic footage in the past week, um, incidents like what we've seen, they seem far away from our state, but as just the example that you were bringing up and how, how uh, people of color in our state uh, can almost certainly end up feeling quite easily, what would you suggest our state do to ensure 
that our police training and actions, and I'm not making any accusations about our police, but what would you do to ensure that our police training and actions guarantee such events do not occur here? And beyond police actions specifically, what steps would you encourage Vermont to take to ensure diversity is respected and protected? So there's kind of two questions there. And if you could do that in two minutes or so, that would be great. All right, I'll try to be brief. The first thing I think we have to talk about is that this is a cultural issue. And I'll just give you one example. We were talking about how people need to stay away from Vermont. And there are good epidemiological reasons to encourage not having travel from out of state. On my side of the border, because I do live on the border, I actually know that Vermonters are more likely to go in and out where I live than our people from out of state to be coming in and out of Vermont. And I think we have to be very careful about how we talk because we may be triggering a fear of others in ways that disproportionately burdens people of color. I'll give you an example. I've been driving a rental car with Pennsylvania plates because my own car just broke down. No one's accosted me, but just down uh, less than a mile from where I am, a black family was stopped in their car and told that they're not welcome here. They're the kind of people who aren't supposed to be here right now. And I think we have to be very careful to message in ways that communicate urgency about health but make that all of our responsibility. And don't try to create a false sense of security by creating a perception that some people are bad. In terms of how we manage the police, some of this is state and some of this is local. I'm grateful that the state police today did, or yesterday did, dis did discourage and unconditionally uh, uh, say that what happened was terrible. But um, we need to go beyond that. And you know, when you're talking about Bennington, some of the challenges there, what we have is a, a crisis of public trust, where members of communities feel that they have been systematically treated in ways that reinforce the perception that their lives aren't as worthy. And we can't afford to wait until there's a dead black body on the floor in Vermont to take this seriously. When one in five citizens in Bennington says they don't feel safe, then we need to act. And there are things that we can do. We can have citizen oversight boards that are representative of the communities that are served. We can ensure better data-driven policing strategies to make sure that we're tracking and making sure people are being treated equitably. And we can train in de-escalation as well. I could talk more. About yeah. Oh, of course. <laughs> yeah, there's uh, plenty of room yeah. in all of these. Um, uh, uh, Lieutenant Governor, if you could follow up on that, please. Uh, I'd appreciate that. Uh, that was the same question in terms of what what would you suggest our state do to ensure that our police trainings and actions? Uh, do I need to unmute you now or not? I do. Oh, I get you. All right. Sorry. I'll yeah, get this can, someday. I, that's okay. I'm happy to mute and unmute myself to make it easier that, for you. Don't and that's worry. why I see if I mute you, then I have to unmute you. But get, no. I got it now. All right. So you can take care of yourself. Thank no you. worries. Uh, small technical problems versus the uh, the truly massive social injustice issues that we are talking about right now. And thank you for making this a highlighted topic. Obviously, it's front and foremost on all of our minds. You know, this is uh, a, a symptom of systemic issues that we've had in this country for a couple hundred years. And it seems like it keeps mounting into a, an event and then it fades away and we can't let this fade away. Uh, this is an issue in our schools with rates of detention and suspension that are disproportionately affecting communities of color. This is an issue that's been systemic from obviously slavery through to the 13th Amendment of the Constitution, through to the GI Bill excluding communities of color, uh, you know, to things like the Tuskegee experiments, and then even continuing with redlining, and of course, even today, like I said, suspension and, and detentions in schools, disproportionate incarceration rates, and even as we look at the reaction to what's going on, where we're now seeing some white right wing people saying, I can't believe they're looting. Well, were they saying, I can't believe that they that a law enforcement officer would sit on George's neck for eight minutes killing him? No, some of these people were not. And so we have to make sure that both socially and in policy and in governance, that this is unacceptable going forward. And we need to make sure that we implement policies that not only truly treat people equally, but make people feel and have a sense of being equal. Because right now, our communities of color 
walk through the streets and through their villages and even driving uh, feel unsafe when law enforcement, which is supposed to be public safety for all, pull them over. I think about this and have many times over when I might have to reach for the glove compartment if, you know, occasionally you get pulled over. But reaching for a glove compartment should not be a risk of a sentence of death. That is such a abhorrent concept. And those of us who have the privilege of being white and don't know how it is to pass through life with that risk and feel um, is, is something that we have to look at ourselves and we have to look at our own implicit biases. And we need to make sure, and I will do this as governor, to really make sure we include people in the discussions, in the policymaking, in our administration, in our policymaking. You know, this is something that I've done for a long time. I've had Round David, I've got to, can, can we, we're, we're a bit over. <laughs> Two I mean, minutes. If we can continue. It. I know it's, of in course. fact, we can do a no, second round good. on it, but I want to, I want to get uh, Patrick's uh, uh, sense on this as well, because I wanted to ask all three of you, Patrick, um, uh, same topic. Um, uh, and, and I specifically was thinking of, of police training and actions, but just broadly, and that's where, um, that's where the Lieutenant governor was going is, you know, the, what steps to, ensure diversity is respected and so forth. So, but any, anywhere you want to go with that, um, you're up. Oops, I didn't, wait a minute, hold on. Uh, did I not, hold on. Somehow I didn't unmute you. Dang, that's my bad. There it is. How's that? My, yeah, good, good. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, in terms of state policy, I haven't been in charge, uh, you know, for the last, uh, you know, decade or, or two uh, in state government, but I would just ask the question, why isn't the Martin Luther King Day uh, respected and, uh, by uh, Vermont? I mean, it's a state, it's a federal holiday, and it should be a state holiday. When I was on the school board in Manchester, I was also on the BRSU, the Bennington Rutland Supervisory Union. And one of the proposals that I made was that all the children stay home as a matter of education and respect for Martin Luther King. And uh, I made the proposal and it was uh, met with a pretty steely silence. And actually it was met with, with hostility. Uh, the only person that I recall even sticking up for my motion was Walt Freed, uh, who was the Speaker of the House, uh, you know, a long time ago. Uh, but he, um, you know, he, he stood up for my, my right to express my opinion, uh, but nobody else had that opinion. I mean, when I was, uh, you know, my, my children were in uh, grade school, they're in their 40s now, but when they were in grade school and in high school, my children never went to school uh, out of respect for Martin Luther King. Even though Martin Luther King Day is a federal holiday, it should also be regarded as a state holiday. And, you know, I think that that undermines uh, the respect that, that people have for people of color and, uh, you know, the history uh, that has been there for uh, black people in uh, the United States and also in, in Vermont. I mean, Vermont is not known as being a, a place for people of color, and I think that we have to uh, provide education. We have to provide, uh, you know, uh, a, a way for people who uh, are on the outside of Vermont to see that uh, Vermont is more racially diverse. And if I'm governor, that's exactly what I'll do. Great, thank you very much. Um, uh, I guess just on that same topic, I didn't have this uh, sketched out or anything. I'll just maybe we can do it as a uh, a hand vote there i've seen recommendations actually nationally but but let's just think of of our state where uh, uh it, there is a required educational component about civil rights and diversity and race um in in our society would would the three of you again show of hand maybe it's it's not easy now but you all say yes and patrick would you say yes as well yes all right well that's good so we all support that um uh, all right. Well, thank you very much. So I, I had uh, other topics as well that a, a week or two ago when I was developing these uh, with others, 
uh, that last topic was didn't move so much to the. I mean, it did, but it. Uh, it I could have picked this one just as well. Um, uh, and, and of course, healthcare reform has been has been a, a very large topic, and and each of you has touched upon that. Uh, uh, but specifically, how would you plan to address this? This uh, it's a very complicated subject, and and specifically, some people wanted to ask about universal primary care. Would you support it, and will you work hard to see it become a reality? And I'm going to start with the lieutenant governor on this one, please, if uh, if you could. Up, oh, I didn't think I did that to you that time. I don't know. Maybe it's one of my, here, uh, there it is, ask to unmute. There, see if that were, you have to do, uh, oh, there you are. All right, okay. I there think, are we good? Yep. Okay, um, I do wanna say, just to finish on that last question, actually, I was very fortunate in my US history class, our textbook was Howard Zinn, A People's History of Ourselves. And that really gave a much more complete, uh, not fully complete, it's impossible but a much more complete perspective with history from uh, many other perspectives than just the white male uh, sort of colonial dominant perspective. Uh, and that's something I'd like to see us talk about in our education system as well. Uh, with respect to healthcare, uh, there's a lot here to that. Uh, I've advocated for my full time in office for a universal healthcare system. I was highly disappointed when it didn't get fully executed by uh, Governor Shumlin. I have supported uh, universal primary care. Of course, as Lieutenant Governor, you don't introduce bills. Uh, you don't actually sort of publicly advocate from the podium because you're the town moderator of the Senate. Uh, but I have worked hard on universal primary care and uh, works to have conversations around that in the State House and outside the State House. We clearly need to have healthcare as a universal system. It's interesting that under the coronavirus, we have a universal system where testing was gonna be free and care for coronavirus when it's a contagious disease. Whereas a lot of other people weren't supportive of universal healthcare when it was your broken leg or your cancer and I couldn't get it from you. Uh, so I think the conversation is gonna be shifting and, and we need someone in, in leadership who's had that experience and talking about it, listening to people and formulating ideas on how to get a universal system implemented in this state. Uh, we need these drastic changes, but it's also important to look at healthcare as a whole systemic issue. Healthcare is about the food system and making sure people have healthy ac access to healthier food. It's about housing and making sure people are housed, which of course, again, during this pandemic, we've suddenly been able to house all of the homeless people in Vermont. Why does it take a pandemic to have the fortitude to do what's right? We find trillions of dollars nationally to, to go to war but why can't we find the money necessary for healthcare and housing? With me as governor, you're gonna have someone who's advocating not only at the state level, but working collaboratively with governors across the country to push our federal uh, system to support these issues as well. Uh, inequity is at the core of a non-universal healthcare system. Rural people suffer with less access to primary care as well as tertiary care. Uh, healthcare should be expanded through our FQHCs. Uh, we could have far more support for our FQHCs to access more primary care for Vermonters. Governor Scott moved to cut primary care supports for folks coming out of medical school uh, when we need that. Uh, I'm sure I'm going to go on too long quickly, but we yeah. also need to adjust one more thing because I think <laughs> this one's a big one for, for primary right. care. My neighbor is a primary care independent doc, and they get a different reimbursement rate than the big hospitals get with the insurance companies. And this neighbor has just sent me a letter saying, we're about to go under because of that and other issues. It is critically important that we get our independent docs, the support and payments from the insurance companies at the same rates as the institutions do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and by the way, my, my thing with time is less, um, uh, you know, we're not a national TV show, uh, you know, uh, that sort of a thing. But I, there's a lot of topics and, sure. and particularly off of what happened last week, I felt, you know, we left a number of good questions uh, uh, on the table. Um, uh, so, uh, Mr. Winburn, I'd like to uh, kind of let you uh, expand on that same topic around, um, uh, around healthcare, uh, universal healthcare, and specifically uh, universal primary care. 
Um, is, that, is this an area of, of central focus for you? Would you be supporting that as governor? Um, yes, uh, 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 healthcare is a right and it's our moral responsibility. And we've had Dr. Dinosaur when uh, Howard Dean uh, was governor, uh, but um, yeah, despite uh, a lot of good intentions, nothing has really happened. Uh, we, we don't have uh, health care uh, for all. Uh, we have health care for uh, different segments of the population. Uh, about five years ago, my wife was diagnosed uh, with metastatic adenocarcinoma, which is better known as um, lung cancer that has uh, spread. And uh, fortunately, we had good health care. I mean, we're a mom and pop uh, law firm. Uh, we're on Main Street. We're, we're Main Street lawyers, not uh, Wall Street lawyers. But if we didn't have health care and we didn't have health insurance that we paid for out of our own pocket, and we pay for that for every employee that we have, um, you know, my wife, uh, you know, would not have made it. And uh, the thing that people don't realize, too, is that, uh, you know, I mean, my wife now is uh, very healthy. And uh, she survived uh, the unsurvivable. She's a cancer survivor. Uh, but if we didn't have he health care, uh, we would have we sold our house. We would have sold everything that we had uh, in order to pay uh, for her immunotherapy just so that she could survive. And I think everybody should have that. I think that is a right. I think it is our moral responsibility. And that's what I would see uh, a Winburn government uh, doing. Great. Thank you very much. Secretary Holcomb, you're up. Thank and you. Thank you. And I just want to go back and mention one last thing. Though I support training and diversity training in all aspects of state government, and we actually did implicit bias training for the entire agency of education while I was there, that's only the beginning. And it really is about being systematic and, and making sure the people who you serve are involved in making decisions about how you serve so that you are responsive to needs. And that's something we need to really pay attention to in Vermont. With respect to um, universal care, we absolutely need to commit to universal primary care um, and single payer. Um, and I think we could start right away with universal COVID care. There's no reason anybody should be paying COVID care at the moment. And that should be something we could do right out of the gate using the, the COVID relief funds while we figure out how to implement the rest of the, of the proposal. Um, and we do that because we know we need health in all policies. And if we can turn into universal primary care and figure out how to make it work and actually do the payment reform that has to happen to make it possible, we will actually solve all the problems that, that Lieutenant Governor was talking about. Some of the disparities in payment between Medi in, with respect or Medicaid reimbursement for different providers, many of those could be solved in the context of payment reform. But we also have to remember as we do this, and I'm going to say this again, that we are managing for the long term to keep people healthy so they don't need expensive treatment when they're sick. And that has to be the first and foremost way as a state we keep people healthy. But we also need to be managing in this transition to how we keep people healthy in the middle of a public health crisis. And I will say again that David Zuckerman says he wants to follow the science. And the science says herd immunity. And herd immunity may require widespread immunization because we need herd immunity for people to be able to go back to work and not be scared. And that means up to 80 or 90% of us may eventually need to get a vaccine. That's the science. And I would just say, if, if, if Zuckerman, uh, Lieutenant Governor Zuckerman thinks I'm misrepresenting his record, he can clarify if he regrets his 2016 vote against removing the philosophical exemption. Well, that is a question for your, uh, for you, Lieutenant Governor, and uh, uh, I, we shouldn't let that one just go by. So uh, you're up on that. Well, let's first clarify that I actually voted for that bill. So that's part of the misrepresentation that's been going on continuously, including uh, pushing articles that have compared me to Donald Trump that my opponent continues to do. So uh, I continue to clarify it. You can go look at my website. There's a press statement about vaccines in general. Uh, my dad was a doctor. My mom had a PhD in biochemistry. I have a chemistry minor. Uh, the science is very clear on immunizations and uh, I support them for our kids in schools. It's that simple. Okay, that is, that's so you, you're not, okay, that's good to hear. The, do you regret your vote on the philosophical exemption? I think that was my question. Right, and the, the bill 
removed the philosophical exemption and I voted for that. Uh, what I was discussing in the amendment was the fact that there are some people who have very severe reactions and I think we need to look at the medical exemptions and make sure uh, the appropriate people are getting those. Uh, and we had that discussion and I voted for the bill. The medical exemption still exists in the bill and that is there for right. the reasons. I think That's the right. question was that you advocated quite strongly against a philosoph uh, for the philosophical exemption at the time. That's what the record shows. Right, and I then voted for the bill and I support that law today. So we're, we've settled the issue. You can go check out my website. Okay, we'll leave it that at, the, uh, at that point uh, and we'll let you and our audience can uh, go to the Lieutenant Governor's website on that particular issue. Um, uh, I'd like to actually ask um, uh, Mr. Winburn if uh, uh, you're up next on this one. Um, and, you know, as small as our, our state uh, is, uh, it's pretty small uh, uh, from a national perspective, it still seems pretty large, especially when I have to drive down to Bennington. Um, but also when looking at policies and understanding how policies affect uh, each of our areas, and our areas, our, our regions within Vermont are actually quite diverse. From your Bennington-based perspective, um, what state policies do you feel fail to represent your corner of the state and uh, and which, you know, that you would you would hope to be able to change as governor. So I'm kind of asking you as a partisan Benningtonite or whatever the term you use there, uh, what would you seek to change um, uh, based on your experience in Bennington? Well, I, I'm sure a lot of the listeners are familiar with uh, Senator Dick Sears, who's had a, a long uh, career as a senator. He refers to Bennington as the uh, the lost kingdom, and uh, he's he's not wrong. Uh, for, uh, Bennington had, does not get its uh, fair share of the uh, funding uh, that uh, Montpelier uh, dishes out. Uh, we don't get our fair share of the respect that uh, we uh, deserve. But also in terms of our school funding, uh, we are you know on the short end of the stick all of the time. And uh, some people, you know, say that uh, the Bennington area is a, a dumping ground in a, in a way for people who have uh, mental health problems and uh, the rest of the state uh, won't uh, help. Uh, what we have to do is we have to provide education and we also have to, in addition to health care for all, we have to recognize the fact that a lot of what we need to do uh, is preventative medicine. If you look at, uh, uh, if you wait until somebody has a catastrophe, until something blows up, then, you know, uh, uh, clearly uh, preventative medicine is, is uh, the key uh, to uh, trying to rectify that kind of a, of a problem. Uh, but, you know, in, in addition to that, um, you know, we, uh, we are a brave little state. Uh, Vermont uh, is, uh, the Republicans that I know uh, are uh, more George Aiken Republicans than Trump Republicans. And I, I would go back to the fact that Governor Scott says he's not going to campaign. Uh, Governor Scott can't run away from his record. He, he has done a reasonable job with the coronavirus uh, for uh, what has gone on so far. Uh, but Governor Scott would perpetuate two more years of the Scott Trump policies. And you, you can't say really that, uh, that he would not perpetuate those when he, he vetoes, uh, you know, he vetoes uh, family leave, uh, he uh, vetoes minimum wage, he vetoes, and he, he has done nothing about the opioid uh, crisis, which is something that is another uh, critical need that's, that should be addressed by everybody in Vermont. Um, you know, I think that uh, I think that some changes have to be made, and I think that the changes that will be made uh, will come on uh, in November. Great, thank you very much, um, uh, Secretary Holcomb. I'm going to actually put you up for the next question, uh, and I know as as the former Secretary of Education, this this is kind of sort of aimed in your direction. Um, uh, you know, there's there's two broad realms of education. There's the K through 12 with with municipal funding, and then there's the post secondary options, which are also in the news these days in terms of you know those are our state colleges, our uh, the VTC. I mean, uh, yes, and the CCV and 
and there's angst right now uh, around funding and roles even uh, where where we go from this point. Um, at the same time, we've watched a lot of our youth uh, either graduate and find poor working uh, choices or, or unemployment, or they've moved out to out-of-state schools and um, post-secondary and, and ended up working outside of the state. Um, how would you seek to adjust? And this is a big question, so I'm going to give you three minutes for this one, but no, maybe 3.15. Uh, how would you seek to adjust our both our K through 12 and post secondary options in ways that lead to more opportunities for our young in Vermont? And this is on a lot of people's mind. How do we not only keep them here, or if they left, how do we? How do they come back? How do we get other young people to want to do their schooling here, or post college or post training want to live and raise their families in Vermont? And I know that's a broad umbrella of a question, but um, I'm sure you've got maybe two or three things at the top of your mind that you could share on that. Yeah, well, I, I, that's, that's a whole topic for debate, for a whole debate. And um, so I'll try to hit three highlights. First of all, I think we need to start looking at the role of early childhood. It's one of the most important in investments we can make. We have excess capacity in our system, and we see that the child care sector is struggling terribly. The workers are not paid well for the valuable work they do, and it's still out of reach for too many families. And we see really exciting partnerships starting between private providers and child care and public school systems to make better use outside Chittenden County in particular of empty space in our school buildings. They can bring down the cost. One example, I was at a school, uh, child care in a school building. They were um, paying, uh, the mother told me she was paying uh, $50 a week. Last year she spent $185 a week. Just that alone, leaving $135 a week in the pocket of every child would be game changing for the state. With respect to K-12, um, we are actually, there is on the table a funding study that I helped write the RFP for before I left. We deliberately pushed to have it be a robust independent study because we expected what we'd find, but we also knew that if it wasn't done by a third party, it would be seen as a partisan document. If some of the recommendations of that study were implemented, districts like Bennington would see a substantial increase in their ability to raise revenue because it acknowledges that we have been underfunding the districts that are rural, that are serving a lot of kids who live in poverty, and districts that are serving English language learners. And we want those students to grow up the best and most able they can. That mean, means their districts need to have the resources to do the job. We need to put the money behind the kids. And then with respect to post-secondary ed, one reason so many people leave the state is because we've chosen not to fund our state college system. And that means it's more expensive. If you want people to see it as a good option that they can afford, we need to invest in it. And there are better ways to both strengthen the partnerships between our high schools and our post-secondary system to tie, tie the kids to that as an option so that they can see that there are opportunities there. But we also need to, to make sure that we make better use of the dollars we're already spending. I've spoken to kids graduating from high school who already have two, two years of college credit and an industry recognized credential that they can use to work while they pay the rest of their way through college. We need to just figure out how to be smart about what we have and to make it work for kids. And we need to understand the critical role that our state college system plays in moving particularly first generation Vermonters and working class Vermonters into middle class jobs that pay far above minimum wage, give them a living wage that lets them live here, live well and raise their families here as well. The kids who go to the state college systems are the ones that make Vermont their home. Great, thank you very much for that. Um, a, uh, a similar question, um, uh, for for the lieutenant governor on that. Um, uh, actually, yeah, I'm sorry, it was down here. Wrong plate, part of the page. Uh, but the, the, the same sort of, uh, from a slightly different angle. Um, um, and again, this is for the lieutenant governor. Um, and let me get your, let me get your video up here on the main page. Um, we had I had a lot of questions come from Windsor County Dem uh, Democratic voters discussing building the economy with sort of the same idea in mind: the younger families uh, being able to stay in the state, uh, want to move to the state. Um, uh, on the other hand, Governor St Scott uh, claims that Vermont is unfriendly to business. 
Uh, so I'm going to ask, uh, do you agree? And, um, and uh, it, certainly there are many that agree that more ought to be done in Montpelier to help navigate, uh, to help firms navigate their way through the maze of permitting. Just broadly then, I mean, with those as just two angles of this question, do you have ideas and suggestions to ease this problem? And how will you frame the debate with the GOP, with, with Governor Scott on, on taxes? Because uh, that always comes up, no matter whether it's health or the environment or any of this or the state colleges, uh, the tax question that eventually surfaces. All right, so I hear taxes, business development, rural economy, stay in Vermont. Yeah, that was very narrow. I you, like. Sorry. Yeah, you've got and you've got a minute and a half. No, I'm I'm only kidding. Oh <laughs> uh, no, I'll give you. You got three minutes for that. Go ahead. All right, I appreciate it. Well, a number of things uh, to just really the the four southern counties for one, the sort of forgotten south of Route Four part of the state. Uh, it's important to talk about these statistics really accurately. Rural Vermont is losing population so is all of rural America. Uh, and so we have to make sure we solve the problem by addressing it with the facts behind it. Uh, the fact is many rural people are leaving, including young people, leaving rural areas. But what Vermont doesn't have is the big city that those folks move to within the state boundary. So it looks like Vermont's got this problem that other people, other states don't. So now that we have the accuracy behind the issue of rural Vermont and rural countryside is losing population. It doesn't matter if it's blue or red policies. So first is to dispel that myth so that the current governor can't continue to fall on the idea that it's overregulation or blue policies that are driving people out. That's not what's happening. But rural America is losing. So what do we need to do about it? We need to expand broadband. We need to build affordable housing. We need to expand childcare opportunities. And if you do all of those things together in rural areas, we have the opportunity, particularly in Southern Vermont, compared to rural Nebraska, that you could have a business in rural Vermont, three or two hours away from major urban areas that you could operate remotely. We're clearly seeing that that's possible during this pandemic. We're seeing that 39% of urban dwellers wanna leave and go to rural areas. So not only could we build and retain the infrastructure to retain Vermonters here, we could actually attract some folks to repopulate our rural areas. That's gonna help with school funding and repopulate our schools. That's gonna help with the opportunity for volunteers and our fire squads and others for people to live and work in their communities rather than driving long distances. That's gonna help fight the climate crisis so that people don't have to drive an hour or two hours to get to work as people do in Vermont. We have the highest per capita mileage. So we really need to invest in our village and town centers with this whole three-way approach of housing, broadband, and childcare. So those are a big piece of it. And as far as business goes, the right wing brings up the Act 250 uh, trope regularly, but actually 95, 96% of applications go through as minor applications with no problem at all. And we need to help small businesses with that, but we actually have a very strong and robust support system for small businesses. I know because I started one in Vermont. I started this farm and have expanded it to now having full-time employees. We've invested in working lands. I think we should expand that. We need to look at our rural economy around agriculture and support the diversification, not just for the, the goal of the word diversity, but actually for the goal of feeding Vermonters. In this current crisis, we are seeing how little of our food we actually grow in Vermont. We need to add uh, incentives for carbon sequestration, whether it's on dairy farms and adding cover crops, or farms like mine that do cover crops to sequester carbon, build the soil, fight the climate crisis, and make our soil more resilient, which also makes our farms more resilient, which makes our communities more food resilient in times of crisis. So all of these things are tied together. And with respect to taxes, I think it's really important to counter the governor and the right-wing rhetoric that taxes on the top end drive people out. The statistics clearly show Vermont has been increasing its number of people in the highest tax brackets. It's that upper middle class and middle class that are really struggling. The poorest people can't afford to move and the richest people can afford to live wherever they want. And what we are seeing is people actually buying to come into Vermont. We need to make sure that they pay their fair share so that Vermonters can afford to stay here by putting that money into affordable housing, increasing the minimum wage, putting into place a universal health care system so that Vermonters can live and work in our rural areas. There's That's the bell. <laughs> <laughs> who's, 
whose bell is that? That was it's, just, uh, it's, it's, it's actually. It's my, it's my wife's 100 year old aunt, she calls uh, every night. It, that was her. So we're ha is, this well, is a was that about right anyway? I probably should have wrapped up anyway. So <laughs> yeah, you fun. should. No, you went over a little bit, but it's good having, uh, good having the, 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 your great aunt's uh, ring in there. Uh, uh, and actually, uh, Mr. Winburn, the next question's for you uh, anyway. And I had questions regarding um, uh, uh, our our justice system. And I, I this is kind of broad, and but I know you're an attorney, and so you've had uh, uh, interactions with that. Um, uh, and I'm, you know, your top three issues at the top of, uh, at the top of the list in terms of. Uh, uh, the, the justice system that you feel require our attention and what you would recommend uh, to resolve those issues? Well, as an attorney, I practice both in state and federal court and other attorneys, if there are uh, any attorneys listening, uh, uh, state court is woefully underfunded. Uh, the uh, people think that uh, you know that the criminal justice system could do a lot better, but it, it's impossible to do a lot better unless you have the funding. Um, I am, you know, I, I I've gone to federal court and I've gone to state court. Going to federal court, it's like the Taj Mahal. They are they are fully funded and maybe even overfunded uh, to some extent. Uh, but uh, uh, Vermont lawyers and Vermont ju uh, judges and the Vermont justice system are not going to really be able to cope with the underfunding that goes on. Um, I am a, uh, the past president of the Vermont Trial Lawyers Association, and uh, I'm also, uh, I know a, a lot of the uh, Vermont Supreme Court justices, and we've talked about this issue. This is a, one of the number one issues on every judge's uh, mind is how are we going to uh, be able to give justice to the state of Vermont if, if we don't have proper funding? Uh, justice Ryber uh, does a, a great job and he does the best job that he can, uh, but without it, some help in the legislature and uh, in the governor's office, uh, it's sort of a hidden problem that people don't really see unless you're one of the you know, recipients of the, the type of justice that Vermont it has to, um, you know, has to, has to give out. And so I would say that funding of the ju justice system itself and judges and, and, and all of the staff, the court staff, the things that, uh, you know, uh, parole uh, uh, and, uh, you know, all, all of the things that people have to deal with in the, the criminal justice system would certainly be a lot better if there was proper funding. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, appreciate that answer. Um, uh, Secretary Holcomb, um, and I, you know, I think we probably all can have, have some discussion on this one. Um, you know, I had some questions that I wanted all three to kind of talk about, and you certainly can add to anything else that you hear as you hear from your, from the other uh, uh, candidates, but we haven't really brought up a, um, uh, so I haven't brought up a specific question on uh, on climate change, and there's you know there are voices that say um, that Vermont's too small to have uh, to have much of an effect, uh, even a minor one. Another is the cost to Vermonters is going to be too high. Um, Governor Scott has said taking action now could be could prove to be a a waste of effort. Uh, I'm, I'm going to guess none of you agree, but uh, I'd be interested to get your response to that. And, and what priority would climate change legislation or regulation have in your administration? What actions would you encourage and, and where, it, you know, where, it, where it sits in your, um, in your agenda? And so again, um, uh, Secretary Holcomb. Thank you. Um, thank you, Al. And first of all, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to share from my experience as Secretary of Education. But I also think it's important for voters to hear a little bit about the issues of criminal justice reform and, uh, and the economy and economic development, because that's something they don't know about. So uh, just to really quickly touch on that, um, with sure. respect to criminal justice reform, parole reform has to be a place to start. And we know that in 2018, for example, there were 127 um, people who were incarcerated and held in Vermont's prisons who were eligible for release but were held due to lack of housing. What we're trying to treat in many cases is a problem of poverty and we need to look at 
to what extent we are incarcerating people who are victims of poverty or experiencing mental health problems or problems with addiction who really need to be someplace when they can get treatment. And it's 69 thousand a plus a, a thousand a, a year I think that we could find better ways to use those dollars to help people get healthy and be part of the Vermont economy um, with respect to business you know just going back to the, the question there part of the problem is we need someone who believes in Vermont who isn't just trying to manage our decline and I was speaking with a business owner in Bennington who said that Governor Scott is like the restaurant owner who stands outside his restaurant complaining about the food inside and then wonders why nobody comes in to eat and and I say that because when I talk to business owners, they tell me there's one place they really have trouble with permitting, and that's permitting to get installation of solar on their business. But by, by and large, they find that other places they can make it work. And certainly in my own experience as a, as a small business owner, that's something we've seen as well. But part of it is we need to, we need to figure out uh, what it is that's gonna make this a great place to do business. We've talked about some, childcare and education. We need statewide broadband. And interestingly enough, the governor has put forward a plan to spend about, get this, 1.3 billion of our 1.25 billion COVID allocation. Doesn't really talk about broadband. It's not his priority. There is no regional equity across the state and particularly in rural communities if they don't have broadband. And I've talked to business owners who've said that by going online, they've been able to increase their sales even through this, this COVID shutdown just by opening up to new markets. The other thing we need to do as a state is prioritize how we invest our economic development dollars. We need to not be focused on retaining big businesses with a tentative foothold in our state and a tenuous commitment. And we need to look at how we grow the next generation of Vermont entrepreneurs, people who are going to be developing those green energy technologies, the grid smart grid management solutions, the new technologies that both create wealth in the state, but are right in our brand of clean and green and help create new opportunity and new resilience down the road. And we need to support the workforce development. Right now we know there's maybe three to 5,000 young people who've graduated from high school but aren't in college or in the workforce. We need to make sure that those young people are connected to jobs. And part of that means they're connected to good jobs that pay them enough to live here and be well. That means they need education. And uh, we're gonna, I assume we're gonna come back to the green energy transition. I would say that it has to be our top priority as well because we have no future. It's already harming our economy. It's harming our farmers. It's harming our infrastructure. It's impairing our health and it will only get worse. That's why I was a very strong advocate of the Global Warming Solutions Act, which will make any governor, even Phil Scott, if he was around, but he won't be, be responsible for throwing a big belt around government and getting the job done. Great, thank you very much. Um, and, and while we're talking actually, uh, uh, Lieutenant Governor, uh, the, um, you know, our, well, I mean, I, I know you know uh, quite well, but we're, we're a proud agricultural state. It ties into the rural aspect of this. Uh, and maybe it's gonna shrink, uh, as you said, I mean, that is partly true, but I think it's also true what you said earlier that that it's not like food's going away either as a as a necessary requirement. Uh, we've had serious challenges. Um, one of my favorite books about Vermont talked all about how the rise and fall of the wool industry and the original rise and fall of the of the dairy industry back in the um, uh, you know when they the refrigerated cars started to uh, uh, be able to bring. Uh, dairy products from Wisconsin. So they've been resilient. Vermont farmers are resilient. Um, and, I, and I've heard you mention this a bit, but I maybe give you a little bit extra time to dig into um, the strategies you would champion to make Vermont agriculture more viable in the coming decade. And again, three, if there's three things uh, topmost in your mind, I'm, I'm sure it could be many more, but um, uh, to bring kind of Vermont agriculture into the uh, well into the 21st century in on a, on a strong footing, what would you do? Well, a couple of things, and I'm glad that um, Secretary Holcomb came back around to the climate at the end of her, of, of her question to really focus on that, because that was the question. And with agriculture, it's paramount that we address the climate crisis. This was the first May in history that Vermont had both measurable snow and temperatures over 90. It was 99 degrees in Hinesburg. 
is number one as an issue to ch that's challenging Vermont farmers. Whether it's the higher winds, the more intense rains, the extended spells of drought, which actually up, up until we just, just got a half, half inch, it was one of the driest springs we've had in a long time. And so we have to have those two things tied together, which means investing in diverse ag and incenting things like cover crops that are gonna hold soil in place during those heavy rains and are also gonna build the organic matter to absorb rain and hold it in place. We need to support farms that are diversifying even also away from the chemicals that are being used that are actually killing our soil and killing our waterways and tie those issues together. We need to recognize that Vermont is the most single commodity dependent state in the country. 70% of our ag dollars are still in dairy. That puts us in a very delicate and precarious position when it comes to anything. You never want to put all your eggs in one basket, as it were. And we are really suffering under commodity milk prices. Uh, we are just coming out of that. And obviously, the COVID crisis has, has plummeted the prices again. We need to look at investing in a Vermont brand of milk that gets Vermont dairy farmers, not necessarily to have to go to organic, but to meet some environmental standards, uh, some animal husbandry standards, and also worker rights standards that would actually fetch a better price in the Southern New England market and decommodify our milk product. Otherwise, those farms are gonna have a very, very hard time to, to succeed against 1,000 and 2,000 and 10,000 and 20,000 cow farms out West. We need to actually build more of the infrastructure for agriculture for storage and processing. You know, farmers could grow more food. We have the equipment, but very few farms have the storage capacity. On my own farm, we have our peak food levels in early uh, November, maybe 100,000 pounds of food. We're one of the bigger farms, not as big as, uh, you know, Paul Harlow or Pete's Greens, but um, in the end of November, early November, we have enough food for Chittenden County residents for less than one pound of food for one day. That's a storage issue. So there are pieces of the infrastructure that need to be expanded to make it possible for farmers uh, to get into and expand their production. And obviously the price of land is really hard. For those who are Kool-Aid drinkers about the extreme goods of capitalism, our high price of land and our high price of housing is because we are in this New England market with Boston and New York folks competing for this same land. We need to make sure land is affordable. And we've done that through VHCB, but maybe even we need to consider during this sort of land rush that looks like it's about to happen, saying, wait, on higher end properties, maybe there should be a higher property transfer tax to put more money into uh, land conservation so that farmers can afford to farm the land and not have more go into development. Broadband is a huge piece of rural development. It's also a huge piece of agriculture as people do value added products on their farms. So I completely, as we've talked about broadband expansion, uh, it's critical to agriculture as well. People think it's only about tech businesses or professional uh, jobs, white collar jobs that can be done through the internet. Farming and farm products can also be sold that way. A quick so question for you on, on internet. Do, do sure. you, you know, I, I had a question. I'm going to ask all three of you, but just keep this part of it short. But, uh, you know, our founders believed that uh, uh, national communication was so essential that it that's, created that's exactly the, right. the postal service, right? So, so now we have this essential um, uh, uh, communication called, called broadband. And, uh, could you, and, and private enterprise has failed to, to really deliver Completely. it throughout the state. So could you envision the state? Of course, there's some municipalities nationally that have established, uh, uh, you know, city-run uh, broadband, but could you envision a state uh, um, uh, owning or managing or regulate, uh, heavily regulated industry uh, for the entire state? Is that a, something that you would support? Well, let, let's start with some of my history, and this is where some folks knock experience, but by being in, in state government for 20 years and before that, being on the Burlington Electric Commission, which is a publicly owned utility in Burlington that has saved Burlington residents thousands and, and in aggregate millions of dollars in bills over the years. Uh, absolutely, I would support public utility, either a statewide public utility or at least serious regulation over these private uh, utilities that are gouging the consumers and not providing the services they're supposed to. We've seen stories all across the country where millions and billions of dollars have been put into expanding internet access and these companies claim to be doing so just by putting down regular copper wire. Right. It's a sham. So right. it is both a regulatory issue uh, and I just want to 
conclude this by saying, when I was on the Burlington Commission, along with moving us to 100% renewable energy, uh, there's also, we've started the process towards Burlington Telecom, which the right-wingers will attack me on, and I don't frankly care if they do, because Burlington Telecom, with some of the highest speed internet in the country, attracted my web grocer, dealer.com, and other small businesses to start and grow and thrive in Burlington. It is a model for the country and we absolutely have to make this investment into our rural area. Well, uh, Secretary Holcomb, if you could uh, either build on that, um, you don't have to, I mean, uh, you can say yes, or, uh, but move on to uh, the, the, the origins of that question were around uh, expanding broadband, but I don't want you to feel limited to that either. Yeah, I think I, I mean I think we do. I think we know we spent about 150 million dollars in broad, government broadband grants and didn't get a lot for it for no, we families didn't. and communities. And um, meanwhile, we also know that with very little financial help, the communications union districts, which are municipal districts that can bond in the municipal bond markets, have done an incredible job. And you're, we're in the Upper Valley right here. We see what EC Fiber has done. Um, and part of it yep. is we, we need to acknowledge that sometimes you need a municipal entity, maybe a government entity, where people can work together to do what they can't do individually. I wouldn't swap EC Fiber out. It's a pretty, you know, it's a pretty yeah. good deal. That's what and I have. Yeah. It has moved into rural communities and given them very high speed fiber. And on this, this is something where we have to use every tool we can. Um, when we administered the new Smarter Balance Assessment, we were the only state in the nation that administered that assessment entirely online. One of the reasons we made that decision is we knew that requiring that it be administered online would challenge school districts to use every available federal E-rate dollar and every USDA subsidy, anything they could get their hands on, to push broadband, hopefully, into every single school building. We did it for all but six. That's how we're gonna have to do it. We're gonna have to support um, community these community union districts, which are government entities. We're gonna have to acknowledge that in rural communities, markets don't always work. If you read Milton Friedman, even he says that. I just think the conservatives in Vermont don't read Milton Friedman, they just talk about it. <laughs> And, and, I think, and I think we need to understand that there's a powerful role for government to make sure that people have access to basic utilities like broadband in Vermont. And I look forward to making that happen. Absolutely. Great. That's good to hear. Uh, Mr. Winburn, yourself on that, on that area, or uh, you can, again, expand it or extend it uh, off of that. But, um, but it certainly does all seem to tie together as well. Well, I think the rural communities in uh, Vermont have to have uh, internet service. They have to have broadband. Uh, if if the if we don't get a, a, you know broadband in Vermont, that's uh, across the state. Part of our state is it's almost like living in a third world country in terms of uh, communications. Uh, children today that are being educated in our schools have to have access to. Uh, the internet. They have to have access to computers. And, you know, we do have uh, two Vermonts. If we don't have broadband that's available uh, for everybody. You know, and I you would support, the, you'd support a state, a state managed, uh, I mean, again, I'm leaving out details, but if the state managed that as a, you know, as a regulated, state regulated industry, that kind of a thing, nonprofit, you'd, you'd be, you'd be supportive of that. Yes, but I, I, I do think that it has to be a mix. Uh, some people are very happy with their internet service that they have, and if it can be done in a cost-effective way, uh, then I, you know, I think that uh, I'm fine with that. Uh, but for the areas that don't have it, uh, they do need the subsidies. They do need the money that's already been appropriated. And I have to, again, ask, why, why hasn't that happened? I mean, this has been going on for a long time. And, uh, you know, we've been underserving uh, smaller communities. I, you know, I live in Bennington. There are areas in Bennington County uh, that don't have access to internet uh, service. I mean, most of Bennington does, but if you drive through the state, uh, you can tell when you're going from one service area to another, and uh, you can actually hear, you know, the, the connection that's being made. And I think that the, you know, lack of funding and the lack of you know, some creative ideas in, in dealing with this issue uh, have left uh, a lot of rural communities, my own uh, community in particular, and my own county and the, 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 you know, the forgotten uh, kingdom down here in southern Vermont, uh, certainly under, underserved. Great. 
Is it a kingdom or a, a grand duchy, would you say? <laughs> anyway, just kidding. Uh, well, it's, a, <laughs> it's a great place. Yeah, it is. Well, there's no part of Vermont that isn't a great place. So uh, that that is for sure. Um, Lieutenant Governor, I've got a, a, you know, I've sort of struggled with this question from the first, you came and joined us, what, three weeks ago or something like that, I believe. Um, and, um, and, and it's, I've, I've really worked on the wording. So uh, <laughs> uh, hopefully this comes out okay. But yeah, you know, in Windsor County, there's long time and proud Democrats that have expressed frustration uh, with attacks on the party itself, not not from you, uh, but just in, in general. Uh, and uh, what would you say uh, to strong Democrats that would ease their mind as they consider to vote for you? Because your, your face is on the Progressive Party website. Um, uh, and and if you win the primary, are, are you going to run as a P slash D or a D slash P, or are you fully in as a Democrat? And and then I just found out today that there are actually two progressives running for the governorship as well. So I just wonder how you see that, and and what you would say. Uh, I'm asking you what you would say to our Windsor County Democrats that that helps them understand because it's complicated. Um, and and I think many of us would rather see this heal, and and not have that division. Sure. But so so fill us in on that if you would. Well, first I just want to have some fun with the region of Bennington uh, County. I, I thought it was the Shire, if I'm not mistaken. I, I always thought Windsor was the, Windsor County was um, the Shire. We're we're Hobbit well, like here. I don't that's know, right. You are you, very Hobbit. We are Hobbitish. Yes. So, but. So anyway, to get to your question and, and start the clock, I apologize for the sidebar there. But, um, well, a couple things. I have really enjoyed the support of Democrats uh, for the last four elections that I've been uh, elected as both parties and also Democrats who have voted for me for many election cycles prior to that. And I'm more than happy to run with both labels. I run in the primary, I win it, and I run with the label. And I've been very supportive of Democrats. I grew up in a Democratic household. My mom was on the school committee uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it is in my blood. Uh, and I also know that across the country, there's a wonderful debate and discourse about the direction of the Democratic Party. And I think that's been led in Vermont as it has moved in a more progressive direction, which I think is fantastic. And so, you know, I thank many Vermonters across the state who have given me their vote in many contested primaries from my Chittenden County Senate primaries, where I won uh, despite some people working against me uh, within the party, much as they did to Bernie. Uh, in the presidential cycles, and in the 2016 primary, where again, my work was to bridge the divides, bring people together. We don't need divides between Chittenden County and rural Vermont. We don't need divides between experts and one uh, folks with like, you know, new to politics versus folks who have experience in politics. We all bring something to the table. And my job as Lieutenant Governor and as I've served uh, in as other roles has been to represent everybody. The party labels are really helpful for election purposes to help people that don't have as much time to either delve into these debates or uh, you know, really work to get to know people as well, to get a broad sense of who we are. But once we're elected, our job is to serve everybody, bring all the voices to the table from disenfranchised communities to people that disagree with us. If you were at the State House, you would see my office has people in who disagree with me on all kinds of issues. And we sit and have wonderful conversations to expand the dialogue of opportunity. And that's what you'll see as governor. The current governor has pushed other people away. He talks about working with everybody, but actually he meets very little with leadership of the Senate. He actually four years ago said, I'm not gonna meet with you at all. We met once for 30 minutes uh, face to face in the last four years. I think a lot of Vermonters would be shocked to know that. And one of the advantages I have in terms of running against him is I've had the support of Democrats, progressives, independents, and many Republicans. And the reason I gather that support is A, I don't think one party label is the be all and end all. Nationally, the tribalism of parties has become toxic. And because as a resident of Chittenden County, who's also a farmer, I have a foot in both worlds. And people respect that. I can bring people to the table from different perspectives and have wonderful conversations about the issues, which is what people really care about. Great, so thank you. I hope that, that resonates. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll, we, will, we will learn that. Uh, uh, Secretary Holcomb, um, same, same kind of question, but uh, from a different angle. I mean, you know, how, 
and, and maybe it's not such a big issue, maybe I'm making more of it than it should, but how, how would you work with progressives to reach consensus on important issues? Uh, uh, which issues would you be willing to acquiesce? Or maybe it's not an issue at all. And that's, uh, you know, I mean, I, I'd be curious your take on that uh, as well from, from where you come. Thank you, Al. Well, you know, I, as you know, I spent my, my career in public education. And one of the things that you do in public schools is you work with everybody because what public school budgets represent is the best agreement a community can come to about what their hopes are for their children. And when we put together a budget and put it before voters, the boards, which are often politically diverse, have argued out to the best of their ability, the best consensus for how we are gonna stand behind our children and make sure they have a bright future. And we know that future is how we think they're going to live, but it's also how we want our community to be strong. And as a public educator, I'm used to doing that. I'm used to working with people across the aisle. And it's certainly what I tried to do as Secretary of Education. I would work with anyone, hear what they believed in, and try to do as governor. Um, that said, it is, it, is a, it is a dilemma because I do believe that right now the threat from the, um, the right is so terrible that we need to be united in opposing it. You know, I grew up in places like Afghanistan where people didn't have the right to vote, didn't have free and fair elections. They didn't have debates, right? Yep. <laughs> you know, you know, and, um, and I know how important our basic public institutions are to the survival and the well-being of a state. I take it very seriously. And as we got on tonight, we were hearing that Trump is thinking about bringing the military into DC. We are facing a threat like we have never faced before. We see in the context of COVID that it appears that we're living in a failed state. And, and willing together, work together regionally to solve climate challenges, to make sure that we're healthy, to make sure that we're creating economic vibrancy, and to confront some of these hideous issues around inequality and racism that are bringing us to our knees. And so we have to be able to work together. We can't afford to be divided. As a candidate, it is challenging because the Democratic Party can't ways because we are in a democratic primary, nor should you. You should be staying out and staying nonpartisan until this is done. And so it, it does make it a different field to run in as someone who's been a life, lifelong Democrat, who has um, driven people to polls, caucused, uh, you know, done all kinds of canvassing. It's just, a, it's just a dilemma. You know, I think I've chosen to stay in the Democratic Party and work hard to push for my commitment to strong institutions and basic equity of opportunity so that people in every county of the state, no matter who they are, where they're from, and how they were born, feels like we're behind them as they work hard to have the best life that they can here. And that's what I'll do. Can I just back check for a second? Because my name was mentioned in that answer. Is that okay, Al? Yeah. Uh, yeah Just a uh, quick fact yeah, check. Sure. I, don't, I don't know Five what Rebecca yep. was talking about in terms of the uh, Progressive Party fundraising for me. Uh, I, I like, I'd sense. like to answer, if I could answer, please. Uh, I, I, like many others, have gone to the Progressive Party caucus to uh, ask for their endorsement. They did give it to me. Um, and they support me, as do uh, the opportunity for people to get the Democratic Party endorsement, which is a process that's gone on for a long time. A couple of years ago, three or four of us all got endorsed by the party in the primary, Democratic primary, and the party stays neutral. So um, I think that's true in, in both parties. Of course, for the general, I think any one of us that could get the support of as many and broad a coalition as possible, which is what it's going to take to beat Governor Scott, mm -hmm. is an asset. But uh, I'm not sure what the, what the sector is talking about in terms of the Progressive Party fundraising. I think it's, I think it's about um, where we encourage, I mean, I believe that we have more than ever uh, to come together. And, you know, it's about, it's about encouraging people to participate in the Democratic caucuses, not in Progressive uh, Party caucuses. It's about fundraising letters and who's sending fundraising letters out. And so those are the kinds of issues that, um, that I'm talking about. Uh, uh, David, you know, did they um, did they send out a fundraising letter for you? 
not that I'm aware of. I think they've said that people will vote for me and support me. Uh, so, you know, if they want to do that, I think that's great. And if uh, Democrats, you know, Democrats have been involved in primaries. This has happened before. This time it's more neutral, although, frankly, the Democratic Party has actually been leaving me out of the uh, statements that uh, elected leaders have been doing, uh, including my um, live updates on coronavirus, uh, the various communications I've sent to the administration to get the UI system moving. Uh, but, you know, we all do have to work together. And I'm actually very pleased to say that I've won the Democratic primary four times. And uh, we'll, I hope to do that again. And, uh, you know, I think drawing the support of all Vermonters is the way to win this race. And we're not going to do that by dividing. And one of the things you're going to see in my campaign is language to bring people together and not to divide us uh, the way that we see at the national level sometimes. And unfortunately, we sometimes see slip into the state level races. Well, Again, let's, let's, I'm talking about that your wasn't a question. Yeah. Well, it, le, le, we're right. We've got like three minutes. So I'm going to let you each have, uh, starting with Mr. Winburn, uh, uh, a minute, a minute and a half. Uh, uh, really, the what leadership traits do you bring to the position of governor that differentiate your your candidacy? So it's kind of a, a summation um, and and something that that uh, that we can take with us. Um, closing your closing statement, sir. Well, I'm a small p progressive Democrat in the mold of Franklin Delano Roosevelt country through a depression. He led the country through uh, World War II. And he also had polio uh, that crippled him for life. Uh, but he was able to overcome those kinds of challenges and to bring the country uh, you know, to a new era. And I think that that's the model that we should really use. I have uh, you know, been a, a lifelong uh, Democrat. I'll always be a Democrat. I'm not running to be somebody. Uh, my wife and my family say that I already am somebody. But here's a challenge that I would make, and I'd make it to Governor Scott, and I would make it to both of my uh, Democratic op opponents. I believe that as soon as it's developed and it's safely developed, that everybody in the state of Vermont should have a free and plentiful uh, vaccination of a coronavirus vaccine. So when the coronavirus vaccine is available and it's safe, everybody in this state, and I would ask everyone to commit to this, including Governor Scott and my opponents, everyone should have a free vaccine. I think that's only reasonable, and I think that's the humane thing to do. Uh, thank you. Uh, Secretary Holcomb, if you could uh, sort of close up here uh, at this point, and uh, same thought, your, your leadership... Uh, traits and anything else you'd want us to take home from this evening? So I, I would close by asking the audience to think about a time when no matter what they did, no matter how hard they tried, they just couldn't make it work. I, I spoke to a mother and she has two kids. One of them is her own. One of them is the ch son of her, um, her sister who's struggling with addiction. She's living in a house where she's worried it's contaminated from the toxin next door. Um, and she was in tears because she works full time as a home health aide, taking care of other people and their families. And she can't take care of her own. In fact, she was saying she couldn't afford some of her food bills. And I say that because these are the people who are taking care of us and we are not taking care of them. And I am running for governor to take care, take, to change that. Because more than ever, we need to change the grotesque inequality with which we entered in, into COVID-19. We need to make sure everybody, no matter who they are, no matter how they live, can live a life with dignity in Vermont, whether they live in a rural county, whether they live in an urban county. And that's what I'm going to do. And to do it, it's going to take skill. It's going to take persistence. It's going to take an ability to make people uncomfortable sometimes so that we do the right thing. And it's going to be, it requires us to be able to manage complex organizations. You know, we're looking at a 55 
a $550 million deficit possibly next year, we're not gonna be able to tax our way out of that. We're gonna to have to have somebody who's really creative and very thoughtful about how to work across sectors, not to do things the same way we've already done, but to do them differently because we're gonna to have to work together to solve our problems, to make some hard choices that put what we have behind our priorities together to get that done. And I think what's gonna win this election is an agency that had a 40% cut in funding and I managed to make it punch above its weight. And, you know, I've been outside the world of politics, but I've spent my life in education. And I happen to think my background and my ability to work inside public institutions, building public trust, is what we need right now to bring this state forward. And if we elect Governor Scott, we'll be looking back in a year and saying he's a nice guy who did a good job closing us down as kids came back from college and people came back from spring break. But the reality is we have a governor who's still relying on paying unemployment insurance and not on creating creating good jobs. We have a governor who's focused on food relief and not on creating food security and food resilience. We have a governor who got 51 recommendations on climate action and didn't follow a single one. And he's attacking public schools and forcing austerity cuts, even as he's asking these institutions to step up and do more than they've ever done. He thinks we can cut it our way to prosperity. I know we can't. And that's because he's, learned, he's failed to learn the lessons of the last recession. I'm running for governor because I believe Vermonters are sick of talk, they want action, and they want someone with the skill and determination to come in and solve our hard problems so that people can live here and live well with dignity. And that's Great. what I'll do. Thank you, appreciate that. And uh, Lieutenant Governor, you're going to uh, close this out. Um, give it a, a minute or between a minute and two. Sure, well, thank you. Obviously, it's no secret that the coronavirus has made this race to beat this administration harder than it would have been otherwise. And of course, Vermont hasn't beaten an incumbent in 56 years. When I got into the race, it was partly because I looked at the numbers and the reality is that many people don't realize I had 7,000 more votes than the governor two years ago. It's gonna take familiarity with the whole state and the people of Vermont's familiarity with the candidates to come together to beat this governor. I believe I'm strongest positioned to do that. Remember, outside of the economic unemployment fiasco of the governor, he's done a pretty good job on the coronavirus. But again, he's done a good job reacting to conditions in Vermont and rarely doing anything proactive. I've been proactive and leading on issues for 20 plus years, from GMOs to marriage equality, broadband to minimum wage, paid family leave, universal health care. People know that I've been at the forefront and leading on many of these issues with Vermonters together to pass many of these pieces of legislation, some first in the country, and that I have that vision and proactive ability to bring to the governor's office to get it done as we rebuild coming out of this horrible situation uh, to actually have Vermont be a complete state where the rural areas succeed as much as Chittenden County. We're working class on years is the way to get it done. Vermonters don't want a governor who's going to solve the problems for them. They want a governor that's going to work with them to solve the problems. And I've won statewide office twice uh, in the last four years to build th uh, that effort. And I've, as lieutenant governor, brought people into the state house who used to not have a voice. My advocacy and organizational work has shown that together we can rebuild our economy with jobs at pay livable wage. We can fight the climate crisis, which will retain and attract young people by building economic opportunity in our rural areas. We've lost 500 solar jobs in the last couple of years under Scott. That's atrocious. Uh, we have to expand healthcare as we've talked about before, and we have to build more affordable housing. And we have to remember, we need to make a Vermont and ensure all Vermonters that those who are indigenous, those who were born here, and those that move here are all a welcome part of our vibrant and inclusive future. I look forward to being your governor. I ask for your support and I ask you to join and visit my website Zuckerman4VT.com. Again that's Zuckerman4VT.com if you want to reach out and help out or ask any further questions 
we would love to hear from you. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you all very much. And I think we're very, uh, we're very lucky to have uh, three excellent candidates and uh, appreciate your time tonight. Uh, this has been recorded. You can watch it again on our Facebook page. I'll also be posting it to uh, YouTube and I'll get that, I'll get that link out to everyone that was in the Zoom meeting. Uh, thank you for all your participation. I'm going to end the meeting. Uh, drive carefully. Oh, wait, we don't have to say that anymore. Uh, but be well, and um, hopefully we'll do more of this as we go through the next few months. Good evening. Thank you, Al. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.